uh, your lecture is on the gut brain axis and peer behavior. Uh, how does the gut interact with the brain and vice versa? So in my personal opinion, having worked in this area for the best part of my career, it's one integrated system. I, I think that um, you have enough communication pathways going from the gut up to the brain, but also coming back to the gut from the brain that I think you, you need to look at this in, in most um, brain or brain-gut disorders as one integrated system. So like an emotion is never just in the brain, it will always involve the signals down to the gut and then the, the feedback from the gut into the brain. So I think it's, that's why we had these prolonged courses of an emotional experience because it's not just on and off of a, of a cell within the brain. And how are now the, micro, the microbiota coming in? You know, the, so the bugs which we have in our gut, what are they doing? So they are in a very unique location because they are at this interface between the signals that come from the brain down into the gut. Like, for example, our stress system releasing norepinephrine into the gut lumen, affecting, we, we know this, change in the behavior, gene expression of the microbes. At the same time, we also know that the microbes produce many substances that can act on the gut, either on the normal gut, stimulating dendritic cells or receptors on uh, enterochromaffin cells, or they can actually leak through the gut if you have a leaky gut and get into the immune system and into the circulation. So the microbes sit exactly on this interface of this circular communication. And then the third arm is, is the diet. So you have the brain-gut microbiome communication, and then the microbes are also strongly affected by what we eat, which modulates that. So it gives, so in my opinion, one of the most interesting things is for the first time, we have this pretty close link, scientific link, between what we eat, what the composition is, and how we feel. As pediatricians, we know uh, the infantile colic, uh, which can be treated with probiotics. But you mentioned in your presentation also that food addiction is triggered or may be triggered by microbiota. What is the evidence for this? Uh, the evidence, I would say, is really indirect at the moment. I think um, some comes, in my opinion, the strongest suggestion comes from what happens with bariatric surgery. So in morbidly obese individuals where nothing else works and you do the surgery on their upper GI tract and not, so initially people thought this was a mechanical thing, malabsorption, right. and, but there are some immediate um, behavioral changes, mainly in terms of these food preferences and what people are craving for. It changes immediately, indicating there's gotta be some signal from the gut, so these surgeries do not involve a vagotomy, which could explain it, but um, th there must be some signal coming from the gut. And since the microbes um, are dynamically altered following the surgery, one good hypothesis is that it's the, diff the change in the signaling of the microbes through these various communication channels that produces this immediate change in um, what you wanna eat and if you wanna eat. One last question. In your book, Mind-Gut Connection, you say, uh, consuming a predominantly plant-based diet is key for gut and brain health. What is the evidence? Okay, so the evidence... Because a lot of people might be interested in this. Yes. <laughs> so I definitely am not a vegetarian, not a vegan. <laughs> there's, even though there's good evidence for health benefits of a vegetarian diet, not on brain health, actually, there's more depression and anxiety in vegans, in, in vegetarians. Than, um, but there's pretty good evidence. There was, was a, a good book on this a few years ago, Pasternak, um, The Healthiest Diets Around the World, and from Asia to um, you know, different European countries and Scandinavia. And one of the common denominators, with the exception of the French, so there must be something unique about the French, <laughs> was that it, it was a similar kind of composition. It was a very um, a high percentage of diverse plant-based foods, including plant-based fats. Uh, 
relatively low component of, of, of red meats and a high, higher level of, of, of fish and some, some chicken. Um, if I go back and I, I it's like in my book I mentioned this example, so way back, some 35 years ago, I had the, the, the privilege to, to be on a film expedition to the Yanomami Indians and, and uh, on, on the Orinoco River and observed their dietary habits um, and that, even though they live in an environment abundant of wild animals, it's largely plant-based, their diet, with small amounts of fish and birds that they, they catch. Obviously, these animals have almost no meat, uh, uh, no, no fat content. Um, and if you just look at their microbial, the properties of their microbiome, they have the highest diversity of anybody that has been, any human being that's been studied in the world. Um, so. With diet, it's always something, you know, it's, it's half philosophy, half science. Um, but I think you can make a pretty good case that that kind of diet is optimal for our microbes because they have evolved to break down all the plant-based components in our food that we can't digest. Um, and so if you believe that a high diversity of your gut microbiome is good for your gut and for your brain, I, I think there's almost no way around it that, uh, you know, if you feed the microbes, what they have evolved for, that, then that, that's this type of a diet. Okay, I take it. So let's go for this type of dinner today in the <laughs> evening. Thank you very much.